All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rebecca Hansen. I'm the executive director with the Newfound Lake Region Association. This is fourth in a series of four um, discussion workshops we've had around um, our for our strategic plan. Um, just a couple of sort of housekeeping ground rule stuff as far as Zoom goes. Um, this is their biggest session so far, so I'm just going to ask folks to keep themselves on mute. Um, just to avoid background noise and side conversations and things like that. If you want to speak, um, this is the mute is not to stifle a conversation, it's just to reduce the noise clutter. So if you want to speak, um, go ahead and unmute yourself, raise your hand if you want to be called on. Feel free to use the chat button, which you can access at the bottom of your screen if you want to, um, if you want to put in a question or a comment without having to, um, without having to speak. Um, I'm watching the chat and I've got, um, another person watching the chat and Andrew, please interrupt me if you see stuff pop in um, that I need to address. Um, so again, welcome everyone. Glad to have you all here. Um, I think most of you are familiar with the Newfound Lake Region Association, um, but just a quick little background. We are, um, since 1971, have been working to protect the Newfound Lake and its watershed. We do this through a number of programs, water quality monitoring, invasive species protection, um, stormwater management projects, watershed planning, education projects, and some land conservation, just to name a few of the stuff we get involved in. Um, and as I mentioned, we were incorporated in 1971. So if you do some quick math, that means we are turning 50 this year. Um, so as we reach our half century mark, it's a great time to look back at all the work we've done, but it's also a really great time to look forward as well. Um, so as we look forward, we're um, thinking about what we want to see this organization look like in the next um, 5, 10, 15, 50 years. What do we want to see this community with this this watershed, what do we want to see the lake look like into the future? Um, and strategic planning sounds kind of boring and dry, but what we're really looking to do is build a foundation on how and some steps into getting to that future that we want to see. Um, the sessions that we've had, we started with a um, community engagement session. We had a session about uh, lake and watershed environmental health. Last week we covered education and we wanted to reserve an, an individual session for the Grey Rocks Conservation Area. Um, mostly because this is an important um, area for the organization, for the community, and we really wanted to, to, to look into that a little further. Um, so those of you who've attended a bunch of sessions, I am going to actually throw up a couple slides here because I think the history um, of this property is, is important as well. Um, so let me just make sure I've got the right screen up. Um, the, I'm not going to go too deep into the history. Um, if you want to know more, we've got some folks here that can certainly help us dig into that further. But um, the Grey Rocks Conservation Area in Hebron uh, was given to us by Andy and Linda McLean in 2012. It had a conservation easement on the property when it was given to us. And I've got this slide up here just to show what it looked like. Um, this is kind of the best overview I can find. You can see the cocker mouth here, but this is the sort of the meat of the property. Um, and this is what it looked like before, um, before it came to NLRA. Very developed, a lot of compact surfaces. Um, it was a marina. Um, we don't have a, I don't have a great aerial shot to show you now, but um, today, well not today, today it looks considerably um, more snowy and icy, um, but we have worked, um, we worked hard to restore the ecological function of the Grey Rocks property. Um, we have um, worked to, with, to um, install plantings that have native plants, pollinator friendly plantings, uh, work to man manage stormwater, uh, and really trying to restore that ecological function of this property. Um, we're also trying to have it be a spot uh, for recreational access, whether you're talking picnicking, walking, paddling, um, all that's available right there. Um, it's also a point, edu point of education where um, we had a story walk there this year where folks could read a picture book as they walk the trails. We've had a number of different programs there. Um, there is an interpretive trail on the, on the um, interpretive signs along the trails as well. We also hold events there. Um, we also find it, it's a place to engage volunteers as well. Um, and there is a conservation easement that's held on this property. It is held by the Lakes Region Conservation Trust. 
And um, so that does give us some restrictions on those properties. We work closely with the Lakes Region Conservation Trust when we want to run programs. Um, change something about the property, you know, picnic benches, tables, benches, signs, things like that. We work with LRCT um, to be able to do that in accordance with the easement. Um, I don't want to spend too much time talking. My job today is more to listen, um, but please feel free to ask questions um, about Gray Rocks, but um, really I would like to um, to hear what everyone else has to say. Um, we are at 17 people here. So I think, um, I think we have time for quick introductions um, or if instead of introductions, I'll just make this optional. The past sessions we've had everyone introduce themselves but we've had fewer than 10 people. I think we've got enough people here that maybe I'll just ask um, a few people voluntary uh, to volunteer themselves and just share um, something really awesome that you've seen at Grey Rocks, um, something that's really inspiring, something that's really neat that you want to share. Um, I, I'll start um, that uh, not the, this, not a huge thing, but last summer I was there amongst the Monarda bee bomb walking along the trail and I saw, and I don't know if I've ever seen this before, but a hummingbird moth, um, which is a moth that's like a hummingbird. Um, pretty neat. So um, anyone else want to share something really neat or amazing? Inspiring. I think, I think the beaver lodge looks pretty good. <laughs> yes. The beavers we're, have we're been wondering if it was, yeah. Indeed they have. Well, they've been they've been cutting down some 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 trees and dragging them into the uh, the channel and <clears throat> stomping yep. on the mud and that sort of thing. I have to say it's they're putting us in an interesting position as a conservation organization yes. when they start taking down trees. So Yes, they do. And uh, children who come and realize that the beaver house is there. Mm -hmm. It's a great educational opportunity for them. Uh, I know there are pros and cons on this, but there's... there's <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping they'll, uh, most of their material will uh, move out in time for uh, us to get our eco tour, eco tour boat in and out of there in the summer. So Don't okay. hold your breath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think you can navigate around that. I think I think at least from what I could see before, before the yeah. ice got in, I think you could navigate around that thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, as you said, a great educational opportunity, even when you're on the eco tour mm -hmm. boat. So, yeah. yes, and there is a, a lot of information on the internet about beavers, mm -hmm. and how they build their dams and what goes on and. Roger was questioning why they had chosen that spot to build that dam. <clears throat> One of the things that we read, items we read, was that sometimes they will build a lodge against a bank and tunnel underneath that bank and go out to where the water flows freely. So do we know if they have done that and gone through to the other side? The water that's been flowing the other side. I think it does. Yeah, I'm not sure, so. but they've, they've definitely had some busy activity. Yes. Other... I, I would just... Oh, go ahead. Well, if whenever we move on from the beaver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can move on anytime you want, Andy. I, I, I would just offer... you got to turn that off off there because it's going to have feedback. I would just offer that if um, we've got two computers here going, I'm trying to get Linda to turn hers off or to, or to join me. A anyway, let's let's just give it a try. Can you hear me? Yep. Sure. Yeah, we can hear you. I can hear myself on her, on her computer is the problem. Um, I've been going up the Cockermouth River exploring the, the lands uh, that are that are now the the uh, gray, gray rocks conservation property since I was a little boy and it and if and I thought I knew everything about that area and if you've never gone on a trip with Rick Vanderpoel you need to do it because he he will show you things and talk to you about things you could that he sees and knows about that you would never discover on your own it's uh, that was that was one of the best experiences as I had last summer was 
going on a is this in a is this in a kayak, Andy, right. or is this walking, or what is it? He's he's just is terrific. It, is this walking or is it kayaking? We were we were we were kayaking, but you could a lot of it you could also do just walking around. Okay. It's, um, it's good timing. We're booking our summer events shortly, so and that is on the list um, because he does run a great program. Rick Vanderpool is the one who set up the the water trail that we have in a brochure, so he did all the research and put that together for us. And he is he's like a a volume, not just one field guide, but a volume of field guides. He, it's incredible how much he knows about about the natural world. So we will be adding him again to our uh, summer event roster. Anyone else want to share something great that they've seen at Grey Rocks? Um, I have a list of questions here, so um, I will I'll just keep going through them. So um, I'm going to follow my discussion question list, but um, but I'd like to see where this conversation goes. This is a large group, so we'll try and make it as organic as possible. But um, uh, kind of in the same lines, things you've seen in Grey Rocks, but what, what do you love about Grey Rocks? I, I'm imagining a lot of the folks that are here tonight are here because they visit it frequently. There's something about it that they love. So I'd love to hear from folks, you know, what's important about Grey Rocks? What do they love about it? Sally. It's a great walk. Uh, my You're husband. Muted. No, I'm not. My husband and I vacation over there in August. We've, we've been coming for about five years and we stay over at the newfound sands area in one of those little one one of the, in bungalow village what used to be bungalow village we discovered gray rocks the first year we were there and we took that eco tour and it was fascinating and since then we've we've kind of been a, every year for a week or two we kind of see how the changes have accrued just in the in the last five years of that gray rocks area my husband is an avid fisherman and he loves to go there just to fish and then an Quite often I will go with him and put my kayak in the water and off I go and I can do my exploring and he can do his fishing. So we just, we're, we're here tonight because we love that little area and it's very special, obviously. So we appreciate all the work that's gone into maintaining it and getting it back to its natural habitat. Great. Yeah, I, I just want to say, I love it because, you know, it's right on the road, but it's not really, I mean, it really is nature. I mean, you're, you're contiguous to the Charles Bean Sanctuary. It is just one of the greatest wetlands, and it's right there. And so the minute you walk around the corner and head up, you are in, you're in nature. You're totally off of civilization. Ah, every once in a while you hear a car, so what? <laughs> and you can see everybody. I mean, that place, you know, I mean, you go there at dawn, that place is like Grand Central Station. There's so many animals. There's so much going on in the wetlands. That it's 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 just amazing that we have this right there. Great, thanks. You don't have to go there, dog. It's nice. It's you don't have to, you know, <laughs> don't, don't mess up your sleep. <laughs> Other folks want to share. I just think you know, just just adding quickly that you know, having had the privilege of being involved with the eco tours for probably four or five years now, each and every one of them starts there. And it's just the, uh, I mean, it's the quintessential spot to start an eco tour because here you are at, at the confluence of the, the river, the lake, and this wetlands area. And, and that just marks it as just a, 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 a unique spot in, in all of nature. And every time that you go up or down the entrance and the return there to Gray Rocks, it, it's, it's like magic. I think all of us, you know, you're looking for the alligator. I mean, you feel like you're going through, you know, the Oki Finoki swamps, and 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 you know the, you know the the turtles, the snakes, the beaver, and and you can you just see them all, and to say nothing of the birds, the the birds are everywhere, and so it, it is just. Uh, I always refer to it as the miracle of Grey Rocks because um, I, 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 as many of you have, you know, I used to take my boat in there to to top it off with fuel because it was the only place to get fuel on the lake. And, and it was just, it, it was a cesspool. I mean, it was absolutely a cesspool. There was oil and gas and, and chaos everywhere. And, and for Andy and Linda, not only to, to create this spot for us, but to get us started down the road on returning it to nature just kind of gave us 
you know, it is. It, it truly is a miracle in every way, shape, or form. In this day and age of, you know, talking about the disasters uh, that we wish we could fix. Well, this is one that has been fixed and, and, and just has so much upside. Uh, I just can't help but get excited about where we are and where we're going because, um, you know, and, and we're going to talk about some of those options tonight, but it, th the excitement is just extraordinary. What a beautiful spot. It really is. Ken. Oh, you're, you're on mute, Ken. <laughs> Says on mute. Am I still? We can hear no, you now. You're, you're, you're okay now. Oh, okay, fine. I, uh, what I'm starting to say is I think I'm near almost every other week, uh, winter, summer, watch the beavers come in. Uh, and uh, every time I go, there is uh, there's something different that I see. Um, it's just that time of the year, whether it's all the plantings or the activities with the beavers and how they change and how they built their lodge. Uh, it's just a fascinating place. And and Bob, I, uh, you did say that it was a swamp that was a cesspool, but I've been going to that uh, marina since uh, Wes Sanborn owned it. Wasn't a cesspool then. He did a great job with it, and also when when Dick Cowan owned it, it was uh, it was a great place to go. It was kept clean, it was pristine, and uh, I think it's only been since the. Uh, <laughs> it changed hands after that, that it, that it became a cesspool, but it was, uh, it's been a lot of changes. And um, you, we talked about the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, trails that uh, Rick Vanderpoel laid out to us and, uh, and gave us an enormous report that's, I don't know where it is or how you get access to it, but told us about every living creature uh, on that uh, site uh, and um, but I was also mentioned that uh, that once those trails were all laid out we had great volunteers uh, particularly Les Mills who did all of those trails put all of those trails kind of cut them all through and and did all of that work for us and without him uh, um, that uh, would have cost us a lot of money to have that done professionally. So it's interesting history with it. It's just a wonderful place. I'm looking forward to going over there in the, in the spring and sitting down on one of the benches and reading a book. <laughs> is uh, Rebecca, is Rick's report on the website? I am not sure. I've got a note to look into that tomorrow. So. Yes, it is. Uh, it is it's a terrific Thanks, report. The, the inventory is online. Yes, Great. I um I will send. I'm going to send an email out to everybody who's participated in this, and I'll make sure there's a link to that. I would say another thing, um, and I don't get up this early very often. Yeah, I don't get up so early at, <laughs> these days. But um, the absolute best time to go up the channel. Uh, to uh, Gray Rocks or up the river is at uh, 5.30 or 6 a.m. in the summer. It's, it's just amazing the birds in particular, the wildlife that you can see in, when dawn is breaking. We should get up and do a little field trip one day. So um, kind of following up on what Ken said about, you know, the number of people that have been involved in making this place happen, it, you know, it's been apparent to me as a relatively new executive director for this organization that Green Rocks is really a fixture in the community. And I'm wondering if folks can weigh in about, you know, what, what does Gray Rocks, how does it fit in the community? How is it valuable to our community at large? Um, I think our community is broad and I'm not trying to narrow down any specific um, zone of the community, but just trying to gauge what where folks see that Gray Rocks fits in. I think it fits in whether you're, you know, very young all the way to, you know, uh, a senior. 
Um, I believe the storybook uh, walk that was added recently is just awesome for the young kids. And actually, I enjoy it myself. And I really appreciate the fact that um, there, you know, we can have benches there or plaques there to honor and memorialize our loved ones um, who've loved the lake and who've loved being up in that area for all these years. So I just think it's a wonderful family place regardless of, of your age and with the picnic tables and the walks and it just gives people a lot of different things to do. Yes, I know, but I'm muted. You are. Can I speak into it? Yes. Oh. Uh, Rebecca? Yeah. Go ahead, Carol. Uh, have, have we tried to uh, uh, organize uh, children's programs with the Bristol Library? I find the librarians down there are just superb. I wonder if we couldn't get some kind of a, a program during the summertime where um, we could read stories to the children uh, that the librarians might select mm -hmm. and have them have it done on site. Mm -hmm. Can I speak to that? Yeah, go ahead, Audrey. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So we've actually been actively partnering with the library for about the last year um, with a number of different programs. Right now, because of COVID, we are doing story times at Grey Rocks, but they're virtual. So we're filming them in advance and people can tune in from home. And um, the story time includes some sort of craft that they can, they can either do at Grey Rocks or do at their, the, at the home at their home. Um, we're also partnering along with the library, the Slim Baker Foundation, who's um, per, who's uh, creating the craft package to go with the story. So it's actually a three-way partnership. Okay. Um, we also worked with the library um, for our nature station programming, which was happening at Grey Rocks Conservation Area. That is an all ages program um, that really is just meant to engage kids and families in um, nature study and enjoying Grey Rocks. And the library would put together a book list that would coordinate with the topic so that people could then go to the library and pick out a number of books that would, uh, that would fit with the theme. Nice. And we look forward, we have great plans to continue working with the library. I agree, they do an excellent job um, mm -hmm. and our partnership has been, has been really great for everyone. Great. I like the you idea know, of the of great. in person story time once, once we're, we're good yeah. to do that stuff again. So go ahead, that Andy. It is our hope that um, we'd like to do a Sandy Point story time as soon as we're able and have families actually meet us out at the Sandy Point viewing platform for story times. Great. Thank you. Thinking about the Grey Rocks, the, the physical space, uh, geographically, it's actually at a pretty interesting location uh, because as Parker noted earlier, you, you drive right by it. Um, you see it as you, as you drive by it. But if, if, you, if you're going a, around the lake, <laughs> certainly if you're going around the north end of the lake, which people do frequently, either, you know, counterclockwise or clockwise, going home or, 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 you know, going to some destination, people end up going th through the village of Hebron and it's, it's just right next to the village. So it's a, it's, it's a pretty good space, right? Obviously right on, on the lake. Ken, I saw you had your hand up. I did. I was, uh, I did. And I was just going to say to uh, Carol, ask a question you got an answer, and that's our Audrey. She's got the answers. Yeah, <laughs> good, all right, awesome. Um, I'm not sure if everyone knows Audrey is our membership manager at NLRA. If you are a member of NLRA, you might not have met her before, but you certainly interact with her because she handles all the communications incoming, outgoing with most of our, um, our membership stuff, so. Um, all right. Um, I would love to hear anything more about our interaction with the community focusing on Grey Rocks and um, maybe thinking a little bit about um, are we well known in the community? Um, I feel like we try and promote NLRA as best we can. Um, who are we missing? Um, how can we engage more people to interact at Grey Rocks? Or are there too many people there? Are we maxed out? I know we've seen a lot of a lot of uh, loving our resources to death, especially during these COVID times when a lot of people are sort of seeking um, refuge and adventure in the outdoors. So. Um, are we reaching enough people? Do we need to reach more? Um, any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. 
it's always great to reach more, but uh, you know that 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 becomes an issue of of uh, PR, and uh, I mean I don't know if if you can get people hopefully like somebody like Marsha Morris for instance to write up an article about the the benefits of the NLRA and, and Gray Rocks and that sort of thing. Marsha is a is a uh, resident of Hebron. Mm -hmm. uh, she used to. Uh, Write a lot for the uh, Reckon Enterprise, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I don't think she's involved with that anymore. But uh, but she's a great writer, and uh, uh, certainly a, a you know a spot in the Reckon Enterprise uh, with a good column that she could write would be, would probably be beneficial. I just um, <clears throat> in the summer it's so active. It's in encouraging to know that um, how many people use it, certainly in the summer, but even in the winter, people go there for walks. But <clears throat> I feel that I wonder how many of those people are NLRA members and how many of them really pay attention to how that place is maintained and exists. <clears throat> so a different kind of presence there might um, encourage people who go there to understand that it is the NLRA that maintains that place and that might be a way to encourage membership. That's a great idea. Thanks, Camille. Mm -hmm. uh, I know this is probably a dicey thing, but uh, do we have a contribution box over there at all? Uh, I don't know if you know, anybody who happens to, to be there I know that you see a lot of cars go in there in the summertime that not necessarily all from New Hampshire. And, uh, you know, it's conceivable if you had something along the line saying that, that it's, a, it's a freebie, but anything, anything that you can part with is well appreciated. I don't know if that's something you want to do. Um, we don't have that there yet. Um, I can see this putting something in the future there. One, one thing that's a problem in the summer that is uh, somewhat controlled, but not controlled as well as I wish it were, is that people who want to use the Hebron Town Beach, who do not have a sticker to allow them to park in the Town Beach, frequently park in the Gray Rocks parking lot, and then carry their coolers and lawn chairs down the road. We, we see them all the time. And I've been trying and trying and trying to get it uh, policed a little more. Uh, it's difficult to do that. But that, th that does account for some of the uh, overflow in the summer. Yep. And, and as to usage, I guess my view would be that too much, um, let's call it legitimate usage, would, would be kind of a nice problem to have. Um, you know, we'd have to learn to better manage it. But but I've always felt that as people use open spaces, um, this is like an argument about too, too many people on the trails in the White Mountains during COVID. Um, and rather than restricting usage, I think it's actually good to have people get out because the more people get out and get on these spaces, especially if there's a way to remind them who the stewards are and, and why they're there, the more they appreciate and in the end of the day, protect nature. That's great. Ken. Um, <clears throat> we talk about community. How do you define uh, community? Uh, are you talking about uh, Hebron as a community? Are you talking about the greater uh, lake as a community? Uh, are you talking about people who are residents uh, or have property here? Are you talking about, uh, who's it, Sally that uh, said earlier that uh, she and her husband would stay over to uh, Bungalow Village and come up? Um, and uh, what, what, are the, uh, what are the demographics of the people that that use our property. Where are they coming from? Are they coming to, up from Bristol? Uh, are they coming over from Alexandria to use it? Or 
Is it uh, uh, is the heavy use uh, just the uh, people from Hebron? I, I think that's an interesting uh, topic to kind of discover and see if we get an answer to. I think that's what I'm trying to circle around here is that I'm I'm not trying to define what community is. I think um, I think it can be it can be all of those things. It can be one of those things. Um, so which of those groups are we missing? Who um, you know, do we need to see more Bristol folks? I, I'm not sure. So I don't have an answer for any of those. Did anyone else want to address community and um, who's who they see at Gray Rocks? I would just say to Ken's point, and I think it's a good one, um, Rebecca, um, maybe uh, in uh, <coughs> at the times of heavier usage, we could uh, try to uh, volunteer staff the, the um, parking area at some point. And I know we do have people down there sometimes watching, weed watching and things like that, that we, we ought to simply ask people where they're from, where they live, if they have a place here, if they're from out of town, if they're here, what town are they in? And we, we come up with a kind of simple, not in, terribly intrusive questionnaire, but just to get a better handle so that we have a baseline on who is using it. Yep. We might do that next summer. Yeah, just to add, just to add on to that, uh, <laughs> in the, um, is it, uh, if someone is uh, a resident of Bristol, uh, are they do they feel welcome to come up and use the Hebron property, or is that uh, is is that an issue? And I was going to suggest because I think it's a really good idea too, Ken, that maybe one of the ways we can collect that information is by having a guest book there at the information mm -hmm. um, kiosk. I've seen that in other places where we've done hikes. And then we'll get a better, not everybody signs it, of course, but then we'll get a better feel of where people are coming from. Yeah. Uh, one thing we've had our students do, I'm at Plymouth State, we've had some uh, intercept surveys that have been done in the past at different places like, um, I think, I think uh, they did them in Squam, they've done them, uh, I forget where else. But the point is that Oh, Mirror Lake up in the, around Hubbard Brook up there. They ask people when they come in, you know, where are you from? They ask them, uh, you know, how long are you staying? And, uh, you know, how much, um, they ask them questions to get at valuation. So the, the point is how much um, do people value this kind of resource? And you can actually put dollar figures on these things if you want to um, in the ecological economics setting and come up with um, some good ideas of how much people would spend to get to the lake, um, you know, for day trippers and things like that. So it helps you uh, define your population and, and what you're managing the, the facility for. Thanks, Joe. Other comments about community and use and um, where people are coming from? So I, I wanna sort of transition a little bit um, before we, cause these conversations tend to, to disappear quickly. We get towards eight o'clock really quickly. Um, several years ago, the NLRA board did vote to put a building at Gray Rocks and our conservation easement, conservation easement allows for um, construction of a certain size building in a certain area on the property. Um, and so I just want to, uh, to talk this through with the group. Um, what would they like to see in a building? What kind of um, services, displays, what, what do you see as being valuable in a structure um, that can support activities at Gray Rocks? Hmm. Sally, I saw so your hand. What's, what's, the, what, what's, the, what's the mission or what's the purpose of the building? What, what I mean, is it, is, it, is it going to be a utility building? Is it going to be an office building? Is it, what, what's the purpose of the building? The purpose is not defined, and that's what I'm hoping to hear from folks that, um, 
that I, I think beyond a utility building, um, I, what I've heard is some sort of watershed interpretive center, a welcome center, an education center, a place where um, we can house NLRA staff, a place where we can run programs and meetings. Um, so these are just sort of the ideas that I've heard thrown around. Um, so um, there is no defined, um, defined building yet. Um, and this is part of the strategic planning process and one reason why specifically we wanted to have this topic um, as one of the discussion workshops is to really see what, what, what do we need here, um, what does our community need um, for in, in a structure. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think that a, a building there that would cover the, all the things that you just listed would um, <clears throat> would accomplish several things. One, it would be a great location to have all the educational um, programs that we want uh, or that you have been done and we can do more. It also would address what Andy was worried about, people using it as an overflow for the beach. <laughs> I think when there's a presence of a building, people are probably less likely to park there and call their stuff away because you know people are there um and i think that just the presence there of the nlra staff and the building being an nlra building will expose give more exposure to the public that comes by <clears throat> to use it may or may not know that there is even this organization that does all these things great thank you camille sally um, as an infrequent visitor there, although I will tell you folks that, that Mark and I drive over there two, three times during the winter season just to see it all. We drive around the lake and we stop at Gray Rocks just to see it because uh, we really enjoy it so much. But um, I know that I have appreciated hearing some of the history today that I didn't know before about what it was. I knew it somewhere I had heard that it had been a marina, but I'd never seen a photograph and the one I could see on the screen was a little small, but I'd love to, if, if there is such a building, it probably would be helpful to have the before and after. This is what it was before and now here we are. I, I, when, as this conversation has been going on a little bit about this building that's going to be there, I began to feel myself panic a little bit that it's going to be this massive tourist thing. And, and I'm not sure that's what Gray Rocks is about. Um, I, I, I guess for me, I felt myself reacting a little strongly to that. Uh, an informational booth, you know, a place for a, a guest book kind of thing, a, a staff person to sit and visit and chat with people. But it's, it began to sound like it was going to be a much bigger building. And that started to panic me a little bit to think that it would change the, for me, it would change what's there to become more commercialized and less the natural beauty that it is. I think I can address the before and after. Um, as I'm looking at the screen here, probably can go back further in knowledge than I think than anyone here, because um, I grew up there, uh, starting 73 years ago. Um, there was nothing. There was there was no marina. Um, in fact, what it was then is. is almost what it is today minus the parking lot. So take away the parking lot, put some trees in and some grass and take away the trails that we've built. It, that's what it was. And it started out as a modest um, marina, but, but in order to become a marina, it involved dredging of the channel that looks like it, it was always there but I can assure you it wasn't. It was, it was probably uh, a foot deep, two feet deep at the deepest in the summer. Um, and a channel was dredged. And first one building was put in and a few docks. And over the years, it expanded into probably somebody who kept a boat there might, might remember now, but I'm gonna say 50 boat slips um, a, um, a large building that had a, uh, um, office, offices in it, had a second floor for storage, uh, had a little shop, 
uh, sold life preservers and water skis and gas tanks. And, um, and then it had a, uh, another building where repairs were done. And then over the years, it added three or four storage buildings. It, it was a complex and uh, it was orderly to begin with. And in the end, it was sprawling. It was um, unattractive. It was uh, environmentally unfriendly. And I can say that with firsthand knowledge, having had to pay for the um, Clean up. <laughs> removal of contaminants and the removal of all the buildings to restore it as closely as possible to nature. So that's, that's what it was. And we all can see what it is today. Um, I think as Rebecca has explained, there's, there's no uh, specific plan for um, the size of a building or precisely what its function would be. But I think it's fair to say that um, it would be, uh, whatever it was, it would be one um, structure. It would hopefully be multi-purpose. So it could house the uh, offices, which by the way, currently ha have to be housed and they're in rented space, um, you know, a mile or two from the water in the center of Bristol, not on the lake. Um, and um, it would be an education center and it would be a information and welcoming center if you like. But in my mind, uh, almost most importantly, it would be a connection between um, the protector of the lake, if you will, uh, that being NLRA and, and, the, and the location. And it, I mean, we've all had experiences um, where we've hiked on trails or we've gone to conservation areas and might have enjoyed them year after year after year and really never know who the owner was or who the steward was or why it was available, might not even have thought about it. And, and by connecting a, a, a physical um, space and structure with, with that location on the lake, I, I think it would just bring about huge awareness. Um, and, and frankly, I think it would help us financially as an organization too. I think it would be, it would help us get more members and help us get more donors over the years. Thanks, Andy. Can I get on, honey? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead, Carol. Go ahead. Hi, uh, just a question. I don't know, who owns the White House that used to be Dick Cowan's house? That is privately owned and occasionally rented out, I think. Um, does that sound, does that sound right, um, Andy? It, Andy would know yeah, more than I. It's, it's, it's owned by two couples um, who live in Massachusetts um, with kids. Uh, I don't know, among them, they probably have five or six children. They're, they use it fairly often during the summer. There are a few times when they rent it out if they're not mm -hmm. there. And I've introduced myself to them and talked with them and they're, um, they're very pleasant. They're, they're, they're great neighbors. Uh, mm -hmm. And they, of course, <laughs> walk down the road to use uh, the, the, the Hebron Town Beach and their, beach. their kids ride their bicycles um, up and down the road, the beach. That's road perfect. Beach. Okay. I, I didn't know if it was a rental property or if people actually owned it. And no, it's, it, it's, it's owned. It's a, think of it as a family place. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Carol. Uh, I, I, um, I thought Andy described it really well, what it could potentially be, um, and summed up a lot of the, you know, multi-purpose uses. I'm curious um, to hear from the NLRA staff about their daily logistics and what it would mean to have everything consolidated over there and, and how, you know, would it facilitate things greatly and may improve improve your lives and help you do your jobs better? 
Um, in short, yes, and not just because it would be wonderful to have an office right, where we could walk and enjoy, enjoy Grey Rocks on a daily basis too. But beyond just that, um, many of you know, I my previous job was with the SLA where we had access to the resource we were, were actively protecting um, right there. Um, and that connection, I think, is, is really important to the staff, as, as Andy mentioned. Um, but um, logistically, yes, it gives us a place to meet our stormwater management staff who we're um, having to cart around tools from place to place, go from the offices to Gray Rocks. Um, you know, if you put a GPS tracker on, on Andrew in the summertime, you'd see how many times he's zigzagging all around the lake um, with Gray Rocks and our offices as a home base. Um, and then just thinking about uh, the shuffle that Audrey does to record a story time at Gray Rocks where she, you know, might come to the office, get equipment, go to Gray Rocks, come back to the office, upload the video. Um, so logistically, it certainly would make a, a bit of difference. Um, and being able to interact with folks on a regular basis. For those of you who have been to our office and have opted to brave the, the flight of stairs instead of taking the, um, the elevator, know that uh, it's not easy to access us. We are in downtown Bristol um, in, a rental bill, in a rental space above the TD Bank. But, um, but we're not, we don't have great frontage. We don't get walk-in visitors. If we do, they're usually trying to make a deposit and not with us. So, um, <laughs> so uh, it's, you know, we just, we don't get a lot of visitor traffic. So we don't get an opportunity to interact with people who are just dropping by. Um, we have been staffing Gray Rocks on weekends with our AmeriCorps, um, two AmeriCorps members that, that we have. Um, so they're interacting with people. Um, but to be able to, for me to step out of my office and interact with a, um, a potential member or somebody who's committed to Newfound and wants to learn more, I, th I think the value there is, um, it's huge. And we, do, we just don't have right that, that right now. Nobody's going to stumble into our office. They might stumble out of our office by accident um, because of the stairs, but nobody's going to just stumble in and, and, and want to learn more. So. I would just like to add one more thing on logistics um, because we've been running some youth programming from Grey Rocks. Um, even during the pandemic, we had some self-guided children's events um, and we were working with some problems like, um, you know, not having a sink, there's only one porta potty um, and not really being able to, we could make our programs far more robust if we had a place where, if we had a place where we could host people more comfortably. Um, so, and that, that was a, a restraint for our programming and I'd love to see our programming grow and a building would help that. Um, and then eco tours too. Um, I think uh, since we are running eco tours from um, from Gray Rocks and provided the beavers get out of the way, we'll continue to do so. Uh, <laughs> but uh, to be able to have a place where people can um, either enter before their eco tour or go after and interact with us, I think um, I think we have a missed opportunity with a lot of our eco tour participants to bring them into NLRA um, as a as a member, as a community member. Um, so having a place where they can they can learn more, they can interact with other staff members and really learn more about what and reinforce what they've learned on their eco tour. So mm -hmm. Ooh, can I say something? I can't even get my hand anymore. Yeah. I tried to I actually I try, can I say something? I, I tried to put a picture of Grey Racks in the back and I failed. That's the only one I find. That's, that is the lake, by the way. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say two quick things. I think more and more education is, education is essentially the focus in many ways of the NLRA. I mean, yes, we, we measure things, we protect things and all that kind of stuff. But the biggest thing is, a big thing is to l tell people what's going on, why it's going on, how it's going on, how to protect it. And I think, you know, we've just raised a lot of money with the Boyd Smith Education Fund. We're going to have more programs. Hopefully we'll hire more people to do education things. And if you have a lot of stuff going on, you know what? You need a place to do it from. So I, I honestly, yeah, you, you can call it anything you want. If there's a building there, you call it a headquarters, which isn't too inspirational. You can call it an education center. It can serve a lot of purposes, but I think education is really a fundamental activity of NLRA these days. And um, I think having something there would be, be smart. 
How, how many people are on staff at this point? We have four people right now. In the, in the so with, you'd need, you'd need, if you're going to have it as an office area uh, for, for the NLRA, you'd, you'd need at least, at least minimum two office spaces, uh, one for yourself <laughs> to be able to work and the other one to be shared by, by people. If, if not more. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is the size of the building. Uh, you know, and obviously the, the bigger the building, the more the cost. Mm -hmm. Obviously you have to have facilities in, in the building. Uh, that was alluded to earlier based on the fact that, you know, if you're going to have, if you're going to have staff there, they have to have the, you know, have to have some sort of facilities, not just sanitation wise, but uh, for for health health issues, uh, you know, you probably have, a, have some sort of a, a kitchen of some of some of some sort. Uh, so, uh, has I, I know that at one point there were there were several uh, submittals relative to buildings. For my square feet, uh, I I don't recall the size. Uh, or or the makeup of them, or the placement of them, where they were going to be. You, you know, know all, I, I, Roger, all of that is in the easement, and we do have plans that we did. We worked up a couple years ago for mm -hmm. two or three types of buildings. You know, and there's limitation, and, and, and you know, there's a limitation on all that stuff. Most of that stuff's been worked out, but what hasn't been worked out is really what. Why do we we want to do it, and what do we really want to have there? But yeah, you're right. I mean. We have plans that uh, Carol Binder's son did for us for free, and they're absolutely beautiful. But the point is, um, you know, we have to strategically really be clear that this is something that is essential for the NLRA to do in terms of its mission, which, which by the way, I think it is something essential. Other thoughts, Rebecca. About if we could, yep. Just if we could for for a second. I know we're talking about the building, but if we can just shift gears for a second, I'd, I'd love to hear from Andrew on, on where we are in the the restoration and his vision for what still needs to be done. I know that much has been done by the plantings and 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 that kind of thing, and I know it's a Herculean task of you know, what you want to do and, and who's going to do it because we certainly have limited resources. But Andrew, I'd love to hear from you on, on where we are and where you'd like to be in, in five years with regard to, you know, the, uh, the, the natural environs there at Gray Rocks. Yeah, uh, thanks, Bob. Um, I would say a lot of our work has, has been front loaded. Um, we built out a plan with the help of a, a professional landscape designer with input from the uh, community. We put in a majority of our plantings, and I, I think that I would say at this point in the game, we're observing and interacting with the property and, and tr trying to see where, where things are growing, where things aren't, what we can add, and, and maybe even what we can take away. Um, I think we are we're looking for some more shade over by the picnic area. I think that's gonna be our next big effort. And, um, and then, it, you know, we've always been reserving this space for the building. So I think we're, we're just going to try not to do too much if there's going to be construction equipment or, or something of, of that nature on the property in the next couple of years. So um, we continue to, uh, to bring back, uh, we're working with um, uh, Andy's brother, Doug from Plymouth um, to bring back some chestnut species and elm species. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I hoped that the, the shade trees in the picnic area are going to be um, some uh, one or two more uh, American elms. So um, that's going to be the next direction we're heading in. Are, are you comfortable that with the AmeriCorps volunteers that we can sustain it without it, you know, becoming overgrown or, I mean, from a workforce perspective, are we going to need volunteers? Are you pretty comfortable with maintaining it with, with what you currently have? Yeah, yeah, actually, um, that's, that's a great, that's a great addition. Um, we, we really want to uh, leverage the volunteer engagement that we can do on the property this year. 
Um, you know, last year sort of got bunged up um, with COVID, but this year um, we're really going to double down on our volunteer engagement piece. Uh, the AmeriCorps will not be doing it alone. And, um, you know, we're going to try to bring as many people into the organization to help with the property as possible. I'll add to you. Part of the measure of success for the AmeriCorps program is volunteer engagement and the part of the purpose of bringing them into the NLRA is for them to to engage with volunteers and um, and to help drive our volunteer effort so other comments about Gray Rocks restoration building um, you can also put comments in chat you can do them privately to me and I'm happy to read them off and not say that you said them um, if you would like to be anonymous. Um, we're closing in on eight o'clock. I'm happy to stay later and continue talking about this but um, I understand if people are um, wanting to uh, get off of Zoom um, at eight o'clock. So, um. Sally. I would like to Hey, thank you. I am going to get off but I'd like to say thank you to all of you for this uh, wonderful evening to for me to learn more about the Gray Rocks, for us to learn more about it. We will con continue to enjoy it when we come over that way and uh, we're so glad it's there for us. So thank you. Thank you, Sally. Is there a synopsis that you have uh, at the kiosk relative to the, uh, the history of the place? I mean, not, not, a, not a, you know, a, a, a volumes, but something succinct and that sort of thing? Not at the kiosk on our list is to look, to really examine what we've got for information on the kiosk and see what needs to be updated. Um, and I know somebody said earlier that we could do a better job branding ourselves and making sure folks know that it is NLRA that owns the property. Um, so um, that is something on the list to, to examine further. So um, I'm not sure. Because, well, go ahead, Carol. Well, Andy's uh, brief description of the property over the past 75 years, I'm giving you a few years, Andy, um, was really interesting because I wasn't aware of some of that. And that was brief and, and could just be something brief like that that people could understand how, how changed it has been over the past 75 years. So let well, me it, it, obviously, if, if there were a facility there at some point, those are the kinds of things that mm -hmm. could be, you know, I mean, they can, they can go, they, they can be nailed on a sign to a tree sure. right now. But, but if you sort of have an interpretive center and, and, and you have a display area, it, there's some wonderful things that could be done there with mm -hmm. old photographs and maps and mm -hmm. things of that sort that would, you know, really help people appreciate what, what really, I, 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 I it's almost, um, it's a return to nature is, is, mm -hmm. is what happened with that place. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's gorgeous. And you know, Rebecca, I, I, I've mentioned this to you by while, while we have an audience. I, I'm going to make just a, a little point. We, and it, 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 it kind of expands the subtitle, but the, the NLRA is the Newfound Lake Region Association, and we, and we, we emphasize the, the, the protection of the, of the water shed and that's what's important to us but I, I often in my longer description like to say view shed because it 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 helps people more quickly understand what we are what we're doing because because watershed is a a concept that everybody on this call knows but not everybody immediately grasps what that you know one word means um, but when you say view shed it, it, it basically basically means if you're anywhere around Newfound Lake, where from the point you're standing, you can see the lake, that means you're in the watershed. And, uh, and, it, and it sort of, it also, I think, broadens the, um, broadens the reach uh, of, from, from where people feel, oh yeah, that's, that's part of me. What they do down there, a mile or two away from me, really Really does matter. Mm -hmm. It's just I, I've gone on too long, but but it's just a it's it's the it's the it's the combination of of watershed and and view shed that's in my view or in my mind our mm -hmm. our our purview. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Thank you, Andy. Nice. Um, can I just add something towards the uh, the history point? Um, Go ahead. It, there's a, a ton of information on our website at newfoundlake.org slash gray rocks, no spaces. Um, we did an e email newsletter specifically on gray rocks last winter, and there's a, a whole uh, email newsletter specifically on history, um, if you're interested. Ooh. I will try and dig those up and include them in uh, my follow-up email that um, I'll right. hopefully send out by uh, Friday. But if we keep adding resources for me to pull out, then it might take a little longer. So, mm -hmm. um, and I and and I wanted to just point out that since you're recording this, you can just type up what Andy said. Yeah. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> yep, it was perfect. <laughs> yep. Does anyone else have anything else to add to the conversation? I have a request. Yes. It, it, I have, uh, uh, this is the first winter in a long time that we have been here all winter. And every day we take a walk somewhere. And we can't help but notice how few people have doggy bags with them when they walk their dogs. Yeah. I wonder if there isn't somehow or other we could address that issue either by posting information about what happens when you leave the dog refuse on the ground, where it goes, it goes straight into our water. And, or uh, at one time, Roger and I put in a, a doggy bag, what do you call station. it? Station at Audubon. And we, every year we refill it and people use that. If we don't have bags in it, and someone sees them and they say, gee, you know, would you pick up? They say, oh, there's no bags in the doggy station. <laughs> so, you know, people need to be reminded mm -hmm. of how we need, what we need to do to keep our water as clean as we all want it to be because we all like to swim in it. Yes, I agree. And um, I will, uh, yeah. Request noted, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, something along the lines that says, you know, please pick up after your yep. dog. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, it, I, I don't think it's it's the it's the responsibility of the NLRA to necessarily provide doggy bags. Uh, you know, they're pretty cheap. You can go to any pet store and buy boxes of the damn things. Uh, but on the other hand, they're also cheap enough that it doesn't make much of a difference that where we have sites, we could have them for people to use. And I, I don't know, it, it can be looked at in a million different ways, but I think that people need a reminder. Yeah, it has been looked at in many different ways. And I can't tell you how many workshops and conferences I've been to that have had, you know, full on hour, two hour, three hour conversations about, you know, how to manage. Oh. Just so, yeah, it is a, um, it's something that oh. is dealing with open space is dealing with, and there's theories on bags or no bags, trash cans, no trash cans, um, you know, fake cameras that say we're watching you, and, you know, so there's, there's a whole <laughs> host of ideas and suggestions <laughs> and theories, so. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank but, you. Uh, yeah, so we will examine how, how we're, uh, how we can help alleviate the situation, so. All right. Anything else from folks? Um, I am going to share my end of meeting slide if I pop that up there. Um, so if you have anything else that, about this topic or others, please go ahead and reach, send them to me directly. Um, the conversation does not have to end tonight. Um, I know many of you have filled out the, the survey that we're also administering as part of the the strategic plan, but you can find that on our website. I am going to close the survey on Monday um, since we're done with our workshop, workshop sessions. Um, so get that survey in um, before the end of the weekend. 
And then finally, Andrew and I are going to be talking about the state of the lake. This is a presentation we first gave last year. We're updating it for 2021, and this will be an annual thing. We're doing that um, via Zoom on March 25th. So if you want to talk a little more about water quality data and trends we're seeing um, and the work that we've done in the past uh, 12 months, uh, tune in in a couple weeks. So great. Awesome. Thank well, you. Thank you all. And for being here. Um, thank you to Andy and Linda too for giving us the opportunity to be able to uh, work on Ray Rocks and to uh, enjoy it. Um, and uh, yeah, please, uh, please reach out if you have any other comments. Um, really, really appreciate the conversations we've had tonight in the past three sessions. So appreciate your feedback and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Rebecca and staff. Thank you. Good night, all. Thank you. Take care.